What's up guys, we're back with another educational video and this week we are talking about stevia. Does it affect your gut microbiome? But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment for the algorithm. A new study was published, 12 week randomized control trial, looking at the effects of stevia on the gut microbiome. What they did was basically have people either be in the control group or have five drops of stevia two times a day. So 10 drops total. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's basically about two servings of stevia. If they looked at the sweetness level, five drops was equivalent to like a teaspoon of sugar sweetness wise. So basically you're looking at like two servings per day. And they had them do this for 12 weeks and then they looked at the broad spectrum of kind of the gut microbiome. Did it change the abundance of certain types of bacteria versus others? Did it impact functionality? This could be a really short synopsis of the study. They basically found very little. There didn't seem to be big differences between control and the stevia group. And there was like a difference in like one species of bacteria they found. It wasn't a big difference, but pretty much everything was the same. Now, do I have any criticism of the study? What are the limitations? Well, first limitation is there was not a placebo. They didn't give like a comparative sweet placebo for stevia, but this is difficult because if you give sucrose, so actual table sugar, there is evidence that sucrose can kind of change the gut microbiome. If you give another artificial sweetener or non-nutritive sweetener, well, we do know some of those can change the gut microbiome. So now your comparator is not appropriate. So while it's a limitation, I don't really know what they could have done differently to kind of control for it. There's evidence that like anything you do or most things you do can at least slightly change the gut microbiome. You know, there wasn't really much they could do. So you could argue, well, there could be a placebo effect. I I'm not sure if that's the case and there's really no way to get around that, at least that I can see. The other thing is it was 12 weeks. Some people will say, well, that's a really short period of time. Really, uh, there's evidence that even in like one to two weeks of a dietary change that you can see differences in the gut microbiome. So I don't think it was too short. I think it was plenty long. I think even the microbiome, a four week study or even a two week study can be plenty of time to see changes in the gut microbiome. So again, I'm not really worried about that. I wanna talk about how this kind of fits into the broader data set of artificial sweeteners. We have some studies looking at other sweeteners like aspartame that showed no effect on the gut microbiome. A couple other studies showed effects of saccharin and sucralose. I think one of the things to keep in mind is the research in the gut microbiome is so new and we know so little about it. There was a study probably a year and a half ago that got a lot of play because they said uh, sucralose and saccharin induce what they called gut dysbiosis, and this got a lot of play. I think one of the things to keep in mind is the study actually screened for people who had basically never used artificial sweeteners. That is such a very difficult subgroup to find uh, because they're so ubiquitous in everything, and they really did a great job of screening for a lot of this stuff. Like the way they screened was very thorough. So really what you're getting is people who have been likely purposefully avoiding artificial sweeteners. They saw these changes, but these are people who are a very specific subgroup who have been avoiding this most likely. And again, it's impossible to mask for placebo wise because they're gonna know if they're getting something sweet. But I think the more important thing is when we look at the changes in the gut microbiome, what we don't know is are these changes a net positive, negative, or neutral for our health. And I'll give you an example of that. Stevia would be by some to be considered the most innocuous sweetener because it's natural. We have these studies showing it doesn't really impact the gut microbiome, but the one impact they did see was they did see a decrease in butyrate production and one species of bacteria that tends to produce butyrate. Whereas in the study on sucralose, they actually saw an increase in the production of one, a species of bacteria that is associated with uh, lower rates of obesity and type two diabetes, and they saw an increase in butyrate production. And butyrate seems to have quite a bit of evidence for positive health effects. The issue is that's just one thing. I think what we need to leave open when we discuss this, these data sets are that certain foods or food ingredients can have both positive and negative effects on our health. And really the question is not, do they have positive or negative effects? But if we look at the hard outcomes, insulin sensitivity, metabolic health, risk of cardiovascular disease, body weight, body fat, what do these big 
markers of health say, these kind of hard endpoints. And when we look at the effect of the consumption of non-nutritive sweeteners, what we really see is neutral or positive effects. And I wanna be clear, the positive effects are not anything inherent to the non-nutritive sweeteners. It's because in randomized control trials where they tell people to have uh, non-nutritive sweeteners or artificial sweeteners, people eat less. So, and that goes for if they're substituting those for sugar sweetened beverages, but they've also seen positive effects when compared to water. What I mean by that is in some of these larger randomized control trials, they'll tell people to either drink water in place of sugar sweetened beverages or non-nutritive sweeteners. Both groups have better outcomes than people who continue to drink sugar sweetened beverages. But in general, artificial or non-nutritive sweetener groups end up eating less calories, losing more body fat than those that substitute with water and have slightly better improvement in their health markers, either neutral or slightly positive. So again, could there be downsides? Yes, but it appears that whatever those downsides may be are probably more than compensated for by the fact that we're seeing improvements in these hard outcome data. And some people say, well, you know, you can't look at uh, what could affect cancer risk over time. I mean, we have a lot of trials now looking at do these non nutritive sweeteners cause cancer? And I think this is an effect of selection bias, the fact that this thought is so prevalent in society that artificial sweeteners cause cancer. And even if you look at some of the association data, the Nutrisanti cohort out of France a few years ago, they showed an association between aspartame consumption and I believe the risk of cancer. They showed an increased risk amongst low to moderate consumers compared to people who didn't consume. But then there wasn't a risk with the high consumers versus people who didn't consume. And so things that are carcinogenic, usually there's a dose response curve. As the dosage increases, the risk of carcinogenity increases. First off, the increased risk in that study was really, really small. Um, it was like a 10% or 15% relative risk increase, which is like an absolute risk increase of like less than, I think less than 1%. So small increase in risk. And again, at the highest dose, if these things are carcinogenic, we would expect the high dose to have a greater risk, but it actually had a lower risk than the moderate dose or the low dose. So again, I'm not saying that these things couldn't have negative health effects. If we look at the consensus of the data, if we look at the hard human outcomes, they seem to at worst be neutral to human health and possibly be beneficial because they help people eat less. I will continue until there is very compelling data or at least compelling data because there's not compelling data even right now to say that non-nutritive sweeteners are fine for human consumption and if they do impact the gut microbiome, it appears to be possibly both positively and negatively, and we don't really know what the net is right now. And hopefully in the next five to 10 years, we will have better techniques, better analysis, more studies, and we'll be able to have some more hard conclusions. So if you enjoy research breakdowns like this, where we kind of make it easy to understand the research, we put it in context with all the other research that's out there, and we do this in a way that's palatable, easy to understand, and as unbiased as we can make it, make sure you check out my research review reps, which is research explained with practical summaries. Uh, every month we break down five studies. We put them in a way that's easy to understand without a bunch of scientific jargon. We tell you what they tested, why they tested it, how they tested it, what they found, and what it means for you. If you're interested in that, click the link in the description, and I will catch you guys next week.